symbolize what I find is a play on a stage controlling minds like a hive and when I shine a light on the lies what I find is a play on a stage controlling minds like a hive when I was young I believed what they told Hi, welcome to Tending the Threshold, a multi-part series where we have the largest conversation of our times. How do we come together as things fall apart? You'll notice I'm wearing a, a mask here because the title of our show tonight is Environmental Collapse, Peering Through the Smoke Screen. And before I do that, I'd like to just make a territorial acknowledgement. Um, this show is live tonight, and it's being filmed and taped uh, here in what is called Ashland, Oregon. And Ashland, Oregon is um, not the original name of this land. This is originally the land of the Tacoma and Shasta tribes. And um, in honor of Grandma Aggie, who is the oldest living member of the Tacoma tribe, I'd like to just take a moment and acknowledge that her birthday is coming up on, on September 11th, and there's a birthday luncheon for her, September 16th. This is a birthday benefit luncheon. The tickets are $40 each, and the money, all the proceeds go to support her, fam her family. Grandma Aggie is the matriarch of her family lineage, and she is a Native American or First Nations spiritual elder from Grants Pass. She is the oldest member of her tribe, the Tacalma, and she has been honored as a living treasure by the Confederated Tribes of Siletz and as a living cultural legend by the Oregon Council of the Arts. Um, so if you are able and available to go to that, that event, please join us. We will be there as well. And I wanted to make a point to show Grandma Aggie and to just really highlight this event. It's very significant. She'll be 94 and she really is a treasure in this area. So um, thank you very much. And uh, I'd also like to introduce to you my co-host. This is Holly Trular. And Holly, would you like to say a sentence or two about yourself? Sure. I just want to take this mask off first. What a strange thing, right? To be talking to each other and doing all these things in a smoke mask, which I know we'll talk about more in just a little bit. But my name is Holly Chular, and I'm a lawyer and a transpersonal therapist. I specifically work with collective grief and trauma, and I do some organize, uh, community organizing. So thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you both. Yeah, thank you, Holly. And uh, tonight we have a special guest with us for this show, Environmental Collapse, Peering Through the Smoke Screen. Um, and I'd like to introduce Dean Walker, who is the author of Impossible Conversation. Dean, would you like to say a little bit about yourself and, um, and how you identify? Sure. Um, how I identify is um, white male privileged um, and grappling with uh, being a long time submerged in the dominant culture uh, person. Um, and I've been um, blessed with being able to do the work that is very much uh, like what you've put together um, in a slightly different way. And um, that involves a little organization that uh, my creative partner, Carolyn Baker, and I have put together called Living Resilience. And um, I've got another book coming up and, and do coaching and content um, generation around exactly this kind of work. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, it's really a pleasure to have Dean, to have you with us uh, as this is the sixth episode of, of these episodes, Tending the Threshold, named after an amazing event that Holly uh, was able to coordinate with an amazing team of people. And um, I was at that event, and at that event was the RAW model as well, and we'll be using the RAW model if we can pull it up on the screen. Um, this is a, a model that came to Holly uh, through work, seeing clients, and, and um, being immersed in the work of grief and transpersonal psychology. And here, um, on this episode, we'll, 
we'll work with the topic of environmental collapse and we'll go through these four phases of acknowledgement and awareness and activation and ascension. And basically this model helps us move from a, pow a power over or dominant um, oppressive model of being to a more collaborative uh, and constructive way of being, which is exactly what we're needing for the times that we're inhabiting. So uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and, and show a video clip to our viewers. Uh, those of you who are living here in Southern Oregon know what, what it looks like outside, but those of you who may be uh, in other places may not. So we have a, a, a video to pull up here so that you can see what reality is usually like in this area and what it's been like for us going on the eighth week uh, after this weekend where normally you can see beautiful mountains and well it's a vivid contrast stars there you can see that we really can't see sometimes even down the street actually yeah and i and i want to say uh where i'm at usually i can see some different mountains right outside my window and literally can't see those sometimes can barely see across the street uh, and really can feel the smoke around me um, and I'm gonna you know I'm curious what your guys' experience is but really sort of recognizing how pervasive it is and uh, excited in a way to acknowledge and talk about how this is really impacting all of us psychologically economically emotionally physically, all of these things. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much, Holly. And in our last episode, uh, we were also talking about environmental collapse, uh, witnessing the world grieve. And in that episode, we talked about the phenomenon of overriding. And this is a phenomenon that is actually protective when we're exposed to information that we don't know what to do with and don't know how to process, and these are unprecedented times. So it's very common for people to just bypass uh, what's going on, to maybe just get on with the day. But in this episode, we're actually taking a moment to connect deeply, to really slow down, and to feel the realities of, of what's actually going on here locally in what's called Ashland, Oregon. And I wanna just ask you, Dean, for a moment, um, in this acknowledgement phase of what's going on here locally, can you speak to what maybe our viewers who aren't here in Ashland, what they might be experiencing locally uh, as well? What are some of the phenomena that, that's going on in our world? I, I think the, it's likely that the, the best way I could do that is to talk about um, my own experience just today. Um, I've been in, involved with the um, distinction, working with the distinction about overriding for years. And um, still, there are times when I don't realize how much I'm overriding. And um, today, there's a brief break in the, in the smoke, and it was the first time I'd seen blue sky in weeks. And I, real, I just, I did that slowing down. I slowed down, looked up, and I realized that there were a dozen different uh, ways in which my body and my system were acknowledging how suppressed I had been, how completely compressed my breathing and my participation with people and with myself, my own thinking had been gummy and slugged. And, and so in waking up, I realized I had been asleep, kind of a thing. And so the overriding had, had been happening like a slow creeping tide when I was just overriding this oppressive force that the smoke had become. So um, I don't know how it occurs for other people. My assumption is that, that most of us are just overriding, just getting through it, going through it, and getting used to it, and complaining about it, and don't really slow, slow down or stop to realize and to feel. Yeah, yeah. I, really, I really appreciate that, and I, it's why for me, I really love opening up with the smoke masks on. There's something for me about like being at the grocery store and the person checking me out has a smoke mask on for good reason. But, and we're trying to talk and I can only see half their face and it feels dehumanizing on both ends and just bizarre. And then everyone's sort of walking around like it's very normal. 
And I know we talked a little bit um, as we were preparing for this about how in some ways this, it, not in some ways, this is the new normal. And it feels important in this acknowledgement phase to really say, um, this isn't gonna get better. You know, I've heard people sort of say, oh, this has happened before, or, you know, we were touching on yesterday, like, fire's a natural thing, and smoke, and it could be really good. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to just kind of explore that for a moment as far as, is that true? Um, yeah, and what yeah. the new normal is. Thank you, Holly. Uh, Dean, would you be willing to speak for a moment just about the new normal and this concept? Yeah, I'm, I am no fire expert by any stretch, but I've lived in the West Coast most of my life. And I've, um, I've been tracking, especially the last five years or so, the, uh, the especially firefighting professionals and listening to them in California and in Oregon in particular. In Oregon, we had our largest fire about five years ago, maybe more, uh, called the Biscuit Fire, half a million acres, and uh, just this just this season, it's still going right now. The Mendocino Complex in California is the largest in California history at about 400,000 acres now. And the firefighting professionals keep saying time and again, this has never happened before. The, the intensity of the firestorm itself is just something they've, they don't know how to fight it. It's so incredibly intense. And, and perhaps you've seen in the news when they talk about fire tornadoes and uh, a fire having its own weather system, this is new. And as Holly was saying, this is the new normal and it promises to do nothing but build in intensity. And if, ironically, that's what's happening here and elsewhere where the fires are happening. And then just a couple of states away, you can have a gargantuan flooding and similarly, those floods are more intense. Look back to last year in, in Hurricane Harvey with 50 inches of rain falling in a, just a couple of days and Hawaii for that matter, just recently. So mm. extremes. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so that, that's a, just taking a moment to acknowledge, taking a moment not to override, not to say, oh, forests love fires and this is how forest re-regulates itself. This is actually unprecedented and so we're taking a moment to really be with it. And also this, this show that we're doing, this, this series, Tending the Threshold, we're dealing with very challenging topics and one of the challenging topics that we're dealing with is racism, is white supremacy. And so part of my curiosity is how is this topic of environmental collapse, the smoke that we're experiencing, how is it related to oppression? How is it related to white supremacy? How is it related to uh, racism? And so for that, I'm just gonna hand it over to Holly. Is there, is there anything that you've been noticing in these past almost eight weeks um, and linking to some of the studies that we're doing in anti-racism work and dismantling oppressive systems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really appreciate this analysis here. It feels really important to me. And so one of the ways that I see this environmental collapse piece and racism, white supremacy being connected is that the way that we, one of the ways we were able to get here was through the exploitation of other humans, typically people who aren't white, who have black and brown bodies and that we've exploited them, we've exploited land, we've exploited animals, and that's how we've even been able to continue to build this massive civilization. Uh, so that's one part of it. And then locally, what I've noticed here is that the people who have more privilege, uh, who have more money or time, can leave. And so they're like, ooh, it's smoky. I don't want to be here anymore. And they go on a trip. And I, in no way am I saying we all need a break sometimes. But even in them leaving, often they're actually then consuming even more resources by flying on airplanes and these types of things. And even just my ability to go into my house, which has a filter in it, is, is a piece of privilege where I think about people who don't have homes or live in their cars, and they can't do that. And the impacts, I mean, we're gonna talk about this in a, in a minute, I think, but the impacts of inhaling the smoke all the time are um, really hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just imagine, and I know I've dealt with that, being 
pretty able to escape in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so those are just a couple ways that I see this linked. Um, and if there's anything that I've kind of swooped over, I'm happy to have you guys add in. No, I re I'm really grateful for what you shared. And just, just this week um, in the news, some of you may have seen in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, at UNC, uh, the University of North Carolina, um, a statue that was honoring the uh, Confederate soldier Silent Sam was toppled by the students and um, in uh, an effort to symbolically topple white supremacy and some of the streams on Facebook were were pointing to um, you know some of the conversation was why would we be worried about um, about these statues about the, these topics when the whole world is is um, facing mass extinction and we're facing environmental collapse. And so, um, Holly, you and I were talking about this just before the show. Is there anything you'd like to say about this topic? Yeah, um, I find this fascinating, actually. Um, at Tending the Threshold, the event, uh, there was about 100 people and we had a conversation about whiteness. I mean, that was the conversation. And what kept happening were pe was people in the room were like, why are we having this conversation when we're all gonna go extinct? And it happened in different ways, but I realized that this was the way that people were popping out of the conversation. And so my question or my, my want, my invitation was, we can have that conversation, but can we have the conversation in the room as well? And so it, it's fascinating to me um, and really sad actually that it felt like a lot of the people with more dominant identities, a lot of the white people would rather talk about the extinction of our entire species and planet than talk about race. And so uh, I don't know exactly, like I don't know what to do with that. For me personally, no matter what's happening, mm -hmm. it, if this is a full scale collapse where humans do go extinct, I think it absolutely matters how we go down and who we go down with. So that's what I've come to in my own life. Hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we were sitting with this topic and sitting with our, our feelings, our emotions as we face environmental collapse. And um, so I'm, I'm wanting to invite you, the viewer, to also kind of take a moment to feel your body, feel your feelings. And when you think about our forests burning, um, millions and millions of acres of forest uh, burning, what are the feelings that come up within your being, within your body? And this is part of the awareness portion. And, um, and so I wanna just say uh, that in my body, I feel anger, I feel rage, and I feel fear. And uh, uh, it can be really overwhelming to really take a moment and feel that, and so I wanna just ask you, Dean, when you sit with this reality and really um, attempt to override overriding, <laughs> right? well, <but. laughs> to, to practice something different than overriding, mm -hmm. but to actually feel, what, what do you feel and as, as a white male who walks with privilege? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's rare for me to have this conversation with a white male who walks with privilege and to really hear feelings and connection to heart, and yeah. so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I have deep grief here. I have deep grief here. I, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, first I am stunned that we live in a country that uh, thinks nothing of paying um, half the workforce in this country work for far less than $15 an hour with no benefits whatsoever. So that just blows my mind, just to start with. But the piece I wanted to just kind of slide into the context that you both laid out so well is um, I, I had just recently found out that um, our Constitution actually justifies that uh, the use of uh, prison labor to fight fires, mm -hmm. and they're paid approximately a dollar a day on average, a dollar a day for human labor that where your life is at stake. And I, that's the, the grief, the, the, there's a hollowness in my heart when I say that. I, and we all know how disproportionately our prisons are filled with people of color. I mean, it's just, 
devastating. The Duke connection is direct. What the points you're making just go right there and connect for me. And uh, I, I don't have much to say except my heart is, is uh, aching and, uh, and I feel a deep shame. Yeah, thank you. And um, just the other day when we were talking, the phrase holy outrage mm. came. Yeah. And I remember that, that that phrase really landed for you. Yep, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Just like this, the last episode that we just did, um, that would happen to be about the oceans where um, I can especially get fired up. But this is really just about the same level of, um, it's literally like lighting a fire inside of me to, mm -hmm. So I think that's good seeing on your part. Yes, I can feel that. Yeah, thank you. Holly, would you like to speak just for a moment about holy outrage? Oh, I mean, I, <laughs> sure. I sometimes, some people call it righteous anger, holy outrage. I, I feel it all the time. Um, I have a friend, Rachel Rice, who does amazing anti-racism work amongst other things and is collapse aware. and. Um, someone asked her, like, what's your spiritual practice? And she said, not murdering people. <laughs> and, like, I get, you know, I was like, fair enough. Um, but that holy outrage for me is important because it um, catalyzes me mm -hmm. into that third phase that, that we've talked about, mm -hmm. um, which is right action or activation. And so for me, sometimes what that means is if I see somebody doing something, um, to an animal or another person or anything, sometimes that means, you know, being like, no, and, and getting in the way. Sometimes that means writing a letter. Sometimes, you know, there's all these different ways um, to sort of deal with that holy outrage, but I find it so important in these times. Um, there's a quote, I'm going to misquote it, I think, but it's something like, if you're not outraged in these times, you're not awake or something yeah. like that. And I, and I just think it's so true. So I, I actually really love me some outraged people. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for moving us also into the activation phase of the model of the radical attunement work. And in this activation phase, what I've noticed that the smoke is doing for me personally in Ashland, moving into the eighth week, is actually enhancing my desire to do the work of dismantling racism. It's actually calling me more um, into community, calling me to really look at who I'm surrounding myself with, and um, I'm having conversations I might not normally have if I didn't need to be staying indoors, and I'm making connections I might not normally be making. So I just want to um, also ask you, Dean, how does this move you into action? And maybe in this moment you could speak a little bit about Resilience Bridge um, mm -hmm. as a possible action that any of our viewers can take, or I, I'm thinking about going there as well. So yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, it, Really, this is just an opportunity to get together to, um, how, do you, how do you put it at the beginning of your show, to come together when things are falling apart. Mm -hmm. That's really all there is left to do that I can see. I mentioned already that I'm not a big hope guy. I'm not a big save the earth person. That doesn't mean that I don't stand up for what I stand up for and get into action when I do. What was uh, lives for me far more profoundly is that we're called to connect. We're connect connect with our deeper selves, connect with each other, and connect with the earth. And so with this workshop, this Resilience Bridge weekend in uh, October here in Ashland, is an opportunity for us to come together and live in real time with one another in this workshop environment and to do just that, to, to look at what surfaces when we allow ourselves to uh, really strip away that override that we all tend to carry and to uh, profoundly connect and um, to ha have authentic expression for some of us for the first time in our lives. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna be there, so I'm excited about that and it's definitely a piece of activation for me of gathering. And um, I know we've talked a little bit about, uh, for me, there's a community response that feels like it wants to happen to the, sm like in the smoke. And there's been some mm. kind of inappropriate ways of calling that uh, together that we don't really need to go into. But what I see is the need for 
um, connection, what I see is the need for prayer or whatever we want to call that. And really like I see people sort of wanting to have conversations like this and wanting to gather in different ways and um, share food, all these things. And for me, that's both the activation phase as well as this ascension or expansion phase, I, I feel like. And so um, I'm curious for either of you how you move into that expansion phase in this specific um, example, if at all. Yeah. Well, for me, it, um, you know, I, I have gone through life coaching, training, and different things where the question is posed, if you had a year to live, how would you live life differently? And I'm noticing that, that those questions are really on the surface for me, what really matters to me. And, um, and this matters to me, being able to gather in community. And we're, we're coming to the end of our show. And so I'd love to know for you, Dean, what does Ascension look like for you? And um, if you could just kind of give us any closing remarks on this topic, that would be. Uh, what you just said is very, very true for me as well. Uh, the only thing I would add is um, that I'm, I'm still shocked at how little we, the cultural we, speak with one another about what most matters to us. Hmm. We just don't. Hmm. And uh, you know, the, the percentage is somewhere up between 60 and 75% of us never talk about these largest issues of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, a profound kind of leading edge for any of us who are privileged to be able to go through this model for, if for any reason. We can uh, keep pushing on that edge to really connect with one another about what matters most. Mm. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, I, I just, I appreciate that so much and appreciate being with both of you so much. And really just, um, I know this is just the tip of the iceberg again. So mm -hmm. I want to say thank you to our show producer, Wanda Borland, and just also plug Resilience Bridge, which is October 11th through the 14th in Ashland, Oregon. So thanks so much for joining us. When I was young, I believed what they told me and when I was young they really tried to mold me but then somehow I knew it wasn't true they were confused I had a clue within my soul that led me to a higher truth but then somehow I knew it wasn't true I was confused I had a clue Within my soul that led me to a higher truth When I was young, I was told the greatest story